Let's take our Bibles and look at Psalm 22. This entire psalm I've entitled simply the Psalm of the Cross. Yes, it is in the Old Testament, but just like every scripture, old or new, points to the Lord Jesus Christ and his work accomplished. And that's where we find here this particular psalm. We'll begin to work down through it and see how far the Lord directs for us to get today and what we don't finish today, the Lord willing, we'll do next time. But the Psalm of the Cross, it begins with this very familiar verse here in verse 1. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me and from the words of my roaring? So immediately when we read this psalm, we know that this is what our Lord Jesus Christ himself cried when he was on the cross. If you look over with me in Matthew chapter 27, and also this particular quote we find in Mark 15, but we'll look at Matthew chapter 27 and verse 46. This particular expression here has been debated by many as to the significance and what it means. And here's where we need the wisdom of the Lord to teach us. But we do know that this is what our Lord Jesus Christ cried when he was on the cross. Matthew chapter 27 and it says in verse 45, now from the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land unto the ninth hour counting from six in the morning to noon that would have been the sixth hour so from noon until the ninth hour which would be three in the afternoon by this standard there was darkness over all the land unto the ninth hour and that word darkness is the same word that we find John using when he talks about the light coming into the world and the darkness comprehending it not. So here we have a view that for three hours, even though it was midday, it was dark. And this fits what the Lord Jesus Christ came to accomplish in his death. He entered into that cross as the substitute for those sinners that the Father had given him and bore that sin, bore, endured that darkness. He did not, himself was not a sinner, but the darkness here is a reflection of what his death was all about on behalf of his people. But here in verse 46, we read, In about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. So this would have been in the Aramaic language. Many of the Jews of the day still spoke Aramaic. It went all the way back to the Babylonian captivity. Those that were in captivity for 70 years, they grew up speaking that Aramaic language and all the way down until the time of Christ, 500 some years later, this was the language that was spoken. And so this was the cry of the Lord, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. And then we have the translation that is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And some of them that stood there when they heard that said, This man calleth for Elias. Because in the Aramaic, Eli, Eli means my God, my God. But they were understanding it to refer to calling on Elijah somehow to come to his aid. And 
Straightway one of them ran and took a sponge and filled it with vinegar and put it on a reed and gave him to drink. And the rest said, let be, let us see whether Elias will come to save him. So you can see natural minds were conflicted, not understanding the sense of what our Lord Jesus Christ was crying here from the cross. But that's what I want us to look at initially here. What is the significance of what our Lord Jesus Christ was crying from the cross? In what sense could it be said that the Lord Jesus was forsaken by his Father? The key to understanding this particular cry is in that word forsaken. Can it be that somehow God the Father turned his back on his son at this hour in which the Lord was bearing the sin of that people that the Father gave him? Well, we know that's an impossibility. There can be no division in the Godhead. There never has been. And this is where some of the so-called theologians like to get into the intricate meaning of how it could be that at this one point in history, somehow there was a division in the Godhead between the Father and the Son, saying that somehow the Father could not look upon the sin that the Son was bearing. But God sees all things. If you consider the sin that the Lord God looks upon every day, in his creation ever since the fall of Adam. True, he is God and of purer eyes than to behold evil in the sense of letting evil come about without there being some consequence. We know God is holy and every sin must be punished. And we know that either sin was punished in the Lord Jesus Christ when he hung there on that cross, or if he did not die for sin of some of his creatures, then that sin still must be punished. And therein is the distinction. Did the Lord Jesus Christ lay down his life to die for every single sinner in the world? Where if that were the case, then there would be no more judgment. So complete is the work of the Lord Jesus Christ at the cross. But we know there's judgment, and we know that when the Lord Jesus laid down his life, he did not lay it down for every single person in the world. In John 17, he thanked the Father, that the Father had given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life unto as many as the Father had given him. In fact, there in John 17, 9, he says, I pray not for the world, but for those that thou hast given me. We've got people today running around praying for everybody's salvation. Not even our Lord Jesus Christ prayed for the salvation of every single sinner, nor did he lay down his life for every single sinner of the world. But we understand, reading from Isaiah chapter 53, and this is the mystery of godliness. This is the mystery of how God has purpose to take sinners and to make them godlike. That's what the word godliness is. It's not anything in the sinner, but all the work is in the Savior. As it says here in Isaiah 53, describing the work of the Lord Jesus Christ in verse 4. Surely he hath, that's the key word there, born our griefs and carried our sorrows yet we did esteem him stricken smitten of God and afflicted so that answers the question who put the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross well God did yes he used means Peter when he was preaching there in the book of Acts he declared that Christ had been delivered up by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, that's in Acts 2 and verse 23, and ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. So yes, 
God used the means of wicked hands, those religious leaders that delivered up his lamb. Here they were, the high priests that were actually delivering up the lamb of God. They did willingly what they did and yet at the same time accomplished the will of God. But he was delivered by the determined counsel and foreknowledge of God. And what Isaiah declares there is that when he was on that cross, he was bearing the sin as one being punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. He had no sin in him, but God put the sin of his people on him. That's the key phrase there. He has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. And he was wounded, verse 5, of Isaiah 53, for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities and the chastisement of our peace. In other words, that chastisement in order for God to reconcile those sinners to himself, it says, was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. With his blood shed unto death, we are healed. And so this is what's taking place here in Psalm 22, it's a prophecy, it's prophetic, it's written by David, but the true author is the Spirit of God. And he declares here what it was for the Lord Jesus Christ to suffer and literally be crushed for the iniquities of his people. When it says there in Isaiah 53, 10, yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. That word bruise is the word to crush, just like you would take wheat and run it through the millstone and crush it into fine flour. That's a beautiful description of what the Lord Jesus Christ endured as the bread of life. Sown as a seed in this earth, he became a man, he grew up, even as Isaiah describes there, as a tender plant, as a root out of dry ground that shows the wicked world in which he came. And he himself had no form or comeliness. And when we shall see him, there's no beauty that we should desire him. He was in his physical manner and form just like any man you would expect to see walking the streets there in Jerusalem in, in that body. And yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him, crush him. In other words, he was cut down just like wheat is harvested and passed through the mill, the grindstone. That's what that word is. And the flour then taken to produce bread baked in the oven all of that is typical of the sufferings that he was to endure. Here it says in Isaiah 53, 10, he hath put him to grief, the cry of our Lord, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me, is a cry of one who is bearing the suffering and enduring the grief. And, but it says, when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. This is what 2 Corinthians 5, 21 is all about when it says he was made sin for us. That's a word that in its deep meaning means he was made a sin offering. He did not become a sinner. There's no way that he could ever have become a sinner and God have accepted his sacrifice, but he was made his soul. This wasn't just physical suffering. Hollywood likes to represent his physical suffering, but here it's the suffering of his soul for sin. And it says, he shall see his seed. That is God the Father would see his seed. Who's the seed? That's Christ. And he would prolong his days, the days of this seed. How did he do that? In raising him from the grave and causing him to ascend on high where he ever lives to intercede for those that the Father gave him. But it says, the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. That's how we know that everyone for whom Christ died, 
the Lord is going to have. They've been redeemed, they've been justified, they've been sanctified, and yes, even glorified. You realize when Christ was raised from the grave, it describes that as being his glorification, ascending into glory. Well, he didn't ascend alone as the high priest with the names of the people on his breastplate. He ascended into heaven, and Paul describes there in Ephesians chapter 2 that every one for whom he paid the debt rose together with him and is seated right now in the heavenlies. And so here we see what it took for the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross to be the redeemer and for God to justify once for all those sinners that he gave him from all eternity. This is the work that was accomplished there. Over in Galatians chapter 3 and verse 13, Paul describes this to the Galatians because they had begun dabbling with a mixed message. Here Paul went preaching Christ for them, and now behind him came these Judaizers that tried to mix the work of Christ with the works of the law. And Paul is very severe in writing to these Galatians, particularly in Galatians 1, where he declares unto them in verse 8, For though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you, than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. Let him be condemned. And again in verse 9, As we said before, so say I now again, If any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. Well, why does Paul use such strong language? That's because if anybody dares to try to put their own works to the work of Christ, then they are accursed. And if they die in that state, they will know nothing but condemnation. But it's the same word that's used over here in Galatians chapter 3 and verse 13. Why is it that our works do not in any way contribute nor our will contribute to the work of Christ. It's because verse 13 of Galatians 3 says, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law. If Christ has not been made that curse, in other words, as the sin offering, bearing the sin before God the Father to satisfy his law and justice, then the only other state that a sinner can be found in is to be accursed himself. But notice it's particular there in verse 13. Christ hath redeemed us, the us and them of Scripture. Here it's referring particularly to those that God the Father gave to his Son for whom he came, and by his death, he bore the curse of the law. What's the curse of the law? It's death. The wages of sin is death. But it says being made a curse for us. Again, it doesn't mean that he was made sinful. The law was very clear that every lamb that was offered had to be a lamb without spot, without blemish. So for him to be made a curse means that the very condemnation of the law. And yes, this is even for the elect. Until Christ died, they were under the condemnation of the law. God was forbearing with those in the Old Testament until Christ came and put away their sin. But still it required that Christ should bear that sin. The blood of bulls and goats couldn't redeem or justify. And again, as it is written, verse 13, see all this is according to scripture. Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. And so in these awful moments that we're reading about here, yes, it was a suffering, and yes, it was a cry of our Lord Jesus Christ unto his Father. He cried this, that we might never 
have to know what it is to suffer the curse of the law and our own sin because Christ so completely bore the curse of that sin and the curse of the law that when he had finished and that's what we find in reading the gospels after he had cried what we read here in Psalm 22 1 my God my God why hast thou forsaken me that his very last cry and it wasn't a whimper it was a cry of victory it is finished and then it says he bowed his head. When it says he bowed his head, he pillowed his head. And uh, he commended his soul, his spirit unto his father. None of us could even enter into, we don't even know the weight of our own sin. Were that to be a condition for our salvation that we would somehow feel the weight of our own sin, God would have to cast us into hell. Such sinners we are. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? But our Lord Jesus Christ knew what it was to bear that sin and suffer unto death and endure the cross in order that such wretches as we are might be saved from eternal condemnation. But in these awful moments. Let me come back here now to this cry. What is the significance of this cry? Well, first of all, is understanding the word why. My God, my God, Psalm 22, 1, why hast thou forsaken me? That word translated here, why, can also be translated wherefore. So it's not a complaint on the part of our Lord on the cross questioning what his father was doing unto him. He acknowledged that he was there because of the glory of his father. But this was more so for those of us now as we consider those awful moments and what the Lord Jesus would have endured from the cross. And... So read this word why from the sense of wherefore. In other words, my God, my God, here is why. There was no punctuation mark in the original Hebrew. No question marks or commas. And so really, this is more of a statement that our Lord Jesus Christ was making rather than questioning wherefore hast thou forsaken me and the word forsaken there is in the sense of abandoning or leaving someone in a particular state without delivering them why was it that the father took the son to the cross and left him there and that he did not come off the cross, even though those around him mocked him and said, well, he saved others, let him save himself. If Christ had come down from that cross, then salvation would not have been accomplished because it was necessary that he be delivered up and that he shed his blood, not just shed his blood, but shed his blood unto death. See, people talk about even one drop of blood being salvation. The literal blood of Christ saved no one. I know that's a shock for some to hear, but there were those Roman soldiers who pierced his side and would have taken and wiped that blood off their spear. Touching that blood did not bring salvation. People get really mystical and superstitious about these things even today where there are certain relics around the world where they say there's pieces of the wood of the steps where Christ would have gone up to judgment or pieces of the wood of the cross they say that have samples of his blood on that and these samples these relics are being worshipped as if somehow that blood has salvation in it no 
The salvation is in the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, the blood had to be shed, but it was the shedding of blood unto death. And why is it that God the Father delivered up his son unto death? That's the statement being made here. If we wonder, wherefore hast thou forsaken me? Wherefore hast thou left me in this state? And when he says, why art thou so far from helping me and from the words of my roaring? This was as much for the people around him as they heard him cry this. When they began to think, well, maybe Elijah is going to come and be his deliverer. But again, the cause for God, the word forsaking there, is not turning his back on his son. It was necessary that God the Father observe his son as the lamb all the way unto his death. Just like the lambs of the Old Testament had to be observed all the way up to their slain, that they be without spot, without blemish. And so here we have God the Father with his eye on his son and yet not removing him from the cross. That's the sense of the word forsaken. And that his roaring here is like as a lion. When you see that word roaring, he's the lion of Judah. He came to conquer sin and death. And this is what he was doing in his roaring. This is not a complaint on the part of the Father, but when you see that word roaring, that means that as a lion goes forth to conquer, so the Lord Jesus Christ here is conquered. And for this reason, he was numbered with the transgressors. There were two thieves on either side of him which represents every sinner. When you stop and think about it, there were three crosses there that day. On the one, there was the thief that continued to mock the Lord Jesus Christ and his heart was never changed. He had sin in him and sin on him and therefore died justly for his sin. On the other hand, you've got a thief that was every bit as guilty and yet at a particular point when the Spirit of God opened his eyes to see who this man was in the middle, none other than the King of Kings and Lord of Lords that even turned to the other thief and said, we do not well. This man has done nothing. He saw the perfection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then when he turned to the Lord Jesus Christ and said, remember me when you come in your kingdom. That's an amazing thing. Here was a dying man, and yet he said, when you come in your kingdom. There was a sinner who had sin in him, but no sin on him. See, there's the difference. This other one had sin in him and sin on him, and therefore he died under that condemnation. This one that the Lord was pleased to show grace and mercy to, even from the cross, yes, was a sinner. He had sin in him, but no sin on him. Why was there no sin on him? It's because the Lord Jesus Christ was bearing that sin. And here he is roaring like a lion conquering that sin on behalf of such a sinner. You say, well, what about Christ himself? Well, here's the beauty of the Lord Jesus Christ. He had no sin in him. He was perfect, sinless, Lamb of God, no sin in him, and yet he had sin on him by imputation and by substitution. Yet he was numbered, it says, among or with the transgressors. He was not numbered as a transgressor. No way he could have been, but he was numbered with the transgressors, with those that the Father had given him to save, and therefore he bore their sins in his own body. He endured that death and judgment and hell and everything that separated the sinner from God at this time now, he was bearing that sin. 
And so in verse 2, as we continue in Psalm 22, and as I said, we'll go as far as we can today and then pick up with this next time. This is too important just to rush through. But verse 2 of Psalm 22, he cries again, O oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but thou hearest not, and in the night season, and am not silent. Some would look at that again and say, well, if he's crying and he's praying and the Lord's not answering, then how could it be that he could accomplish the will of God? This is describing his life and his death when he cried in the daytime. That would have been during his life. If you think about all the times that our Lord Jesus Christ set himself apart to pray. Some people question that and say, well, if he was the son of God and he knew all things, why pray? Such was the communion that there was between he and the Father. So that's what he's describing here, remembering that all the way up to the cross. I cry in the daytime, but thou hearest not. When it says thou hearest not, it means that now his particular prayer would not be that somehow the Father would deliver him from that cross. Here again, we see that when it says here, and in the night season, that's what this was for the Lord Jesus Christ. This was the night season. This was the time when God the Father, the hands of sinners who sought to kill him in, in some other way. But here now, when he says, thou hearest not, it means that at this particular time, it would be as if God would not hear his prayer. But then again, the Lord never asked anything but what God's will be done. So this is the mystery that the Lord Jesus Christ in his prayers, it was as if heaven was shut up to him that he should suffer and die, but that God's ears then would be open to his elect when they cry unto him. Why is it that God hears our prayers? It's because the Lord Jesus Christ himself endured this suffering on behalf of his elect. And so complete was that work that now, when we are instructed according to the scriptures to enter into his presence, come boldly before the throne of grace to find grace to help in time of need, it says there in Hebrews 4, it's all because of what the Lord Jesus Christ himself would have endured. As I said, this is a mystery of how the Father and the Son would have dealt with each other at this particular critical time. All of eternity came down to this particular time that the Lord Jesus Christ should suffer and die. And uh, that Christ should feel in his body and in his soul the desolation of what it is for sin to separate one from the Father, and yet he had no sin. And you say, well, what's the reason for all of this? This is what I love about Scripture. As you continue to read, all of the answers are there. Here in verse 3 of Psalm 22, Here's the reason. Why all of this? It says, but thou art holy. O thou that inhabitest the praises of Israel. What was the reason why Christ had to suffer? Certainly wasn't for any sin in himself. But God is holy. And if we want to have even an inkling of what holiness is, and we don't, you can look at God's judgments, days of Noah when he flooded the earth, or you can look at Sodom and Gomorrah, how he destroyed that city. Read all the different judgments, but if you want a clear revelation or picture of what it is for God to be holy, 
and for God to judge sinners, then look no further than the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. His wrath being poured out upon his son is the greatest demonstration of God's holiness and justice. You can even look at hell and the condemnation of sinners for eternity and say, well, boy, that's the holiness and justice of God. And yes, it is, but it pales. Even sinners suffering in hell, that picture pales in comparison to what we're reading here as to what the Lord Jesus Christ himself had to endure. In order for God to be merciful, in order for God to love, in order for God to be gracious to any sinner, then it required nothing less than for his son to die in order to satisfy God's holiness. And that's seen here in, again, this question, wherefore, to what purpose has God forsaken or left his son to die on that cross? It's for no other purpose than that God must be just and holy even in the expression of his love. You've heard me say it many times that if you take the attributes of God and liken it to a wheel with a hub where our generation has gone wrong is that they want to make the love of God to be the principal attribute. And so if you look at the spokes of the wheel that go out from love, yes, it can explain his mercy it can explain his grace. It can explain his long suffering, all attributes of God. But now, now when you come to his wrath, how can you explain God's wrath in light of his love or his justice? You see, that's where the wheel begins to wobble as men have put it together. But do this. Take love out and put in their holiness. God is holy. And now it all fits with regard to his love and mercy and grace. It's a holy love, mercy, and grace. He doesn't just generally love sinner. No, his holiness had to be satisfied. And his wrath, it's a holy wrath, a holy justice that required nothing less than the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. And because Lord Jesus so fully satisfied God's law and justice, there remain nothing but righteousness to impute to the account of those sinners for whom he died. When you want to know, well, when were God's elect justified? Some want to put it in eternity. They want to say, well, as soon as God thought it, then they were justified. But when you read the scriptures, yes, in God's purpose, they were to be justified. God's holy and just, but he gave sinners to his son in eternity that his son should come and pay their sin debt. And until he did, all those living under the law in the Old Testament, it was under God's forbearance. He was forbearing with them. God passing over their sin until Christ should come and pay their sin debt. And so in one time, in one place, in one sacrifice, in one person, God once for all justified his people. That's the message of the cross. That's the message of the gospel. Some want to put it at faith. They say, well, it's when you believe that God justifies you. No, faith is the evidence. Faith is the fruit of the work of the Lord Jesus Christ that he accomplished at the cross. It's by faith, the Spirit giving that faith, revealing Christ, that the sinner sees that when Christ died, that's where the sin debt was paid. That's where sin was put away. And that's where righteousness was imputed there at the cross. So we dare not get that wrong. Well, two more verses we'll look at here and then pick up with verse 6 next time. But it says here in verses 4 and 5, Our fathers trusted in thee, 
They trusted, and thou, thou didst deliver them. They cried unto thee, and were delivered. They trusted in thee, and were not confounded. What is the Lord pleading here in this statement concerning the fathers? Well, he's looking to God and his faithfulness of how he had dealt with his people in times past. Three times, it says here, they trusted and in that trusting were not put to shame. So you can see here how the thoughts of our Lord would have been even as God was faithful to those that were his in the Old Testament leading up to the cross and that God delivered them, first of all gave them the trust to believe on him and then delivered them if he did that with sinners to whom he would show mercy, is it not even more so true that he would so deal with his son who was without sin? They trusted thee, they trusted in thee, and here our Lord, when he describes, he says, our fathers, in the plural, it shows his oneness even with these of the Old Testament. It's not talking about all the children of Israel there. When he says our fathers, it's talking about Moses. It's talking about David. It's talking about these that were of God's elect for whom Christ would come and pay the sin debt. But he identifies with them as being one with them because that's why he died. He didn't die for any sin of his own, but he died on their behalf. And if God was faithful and just to forgive them and hear them, all the while they were awaiting Christ to come, then it should not be surprising then that he would be faithful to his son, even more so. It's moving in an argument from less to, to greater here. If our fathers trusted in thee, and they did trust, and thou deliverest them, why should we think it anything more amazing that he should deliver his son. And here the expression and senses that Christ put his trust. See, we're unbelievers. So for Christ to be the substitute, even as these in type and picture trusted in thee and, and the Father delivered them when they cried unto him and were delivered, that the Lord Jesus Christ in trusting his father as the substitute that his people then should be delivered. What a beautiful song. And I pray that the Lord will bless what we've heard and give us eyes to behold the wonders and the beauty of our Lord Jesus Christ as the suffering Savior, but the victorious Savior, that through this God would be pleased to save such wretches as we are. Amen.